Hi there, everybody. Vin Rogers, Jr., as if you didn't know, reading the sign. Here I am. I'll walk into the shot. And as I do so, our videographer, Ski, is going to cut back so as to show you all the wonderful things I have to show you today. It's a show and tell, folks. It's a show and tell. I hope you enjoy it. Oh, boy. It has to do with the Turin Shroud, or the Shroud of Turin. This is supposedly the burial cloth of Jesus himself. And uh, it, uh, it, of course, it's a hoax. Uh, it's, it's a complete, completely phony thing. But I was greatly saddened to see recently, it was on, ex on exhibition once again in, in Turin, and the new pope, Francis I, here he is on his knees before the holy altar, and overhead is the Shroud of Turin. So that causes me once again to address this subject. I've done it. I've given a number of lectures on this subject many years ago, and I thought that was the end of it because it, they had done a, a, a test of the cloth through, uh, uh, through spectrometry and proved that it's, it's just a complete hoax. It didn't even need that, basically, because the, uh, everything was against it in the first place. But let me, let me run through the story for you. First of all, here is the Shroud of Turin. And it's a little hard for you to see in the shot what it's all about, but I'll talk, I'll talk our way through it a little bit. Here, here you see the head of Jesus. And here's his body, and you may not be able to make, but here's his hands over his genitals, coyly uh, hiding them, and his legs here. And if one looks at it in detail, you see a, a, a person who's been, uh, has the mark of the nails and all this sort of thing. And uh, so how did they get this image? Well, now, I'll show you how this was done. Uh, supposedly, let's take a look right here. I have here a mummy. <laughs> he's good and dead. Now, he's lying on a, on a piece of cloth, you see. Now, if I take this, this is a burial cloth, supposedly. Now, if I take the cloth and bring it over the figure like this, what's supposed to have happened with regard to the Shroud of Turin is that it left an impression of Jesus. That's the story. That's the story. Well, let's see how this story unfolds. What's amazing about it, ladies and gentlemen, is the fact it was known to be a hoax in the first place. That's the crazy thing. It needn't have ever gone any further. It starts out like this. In 1353, a French family, the guy was a, uh, he was a knight in the service of, uh, uh, of the king of France, and he applied for permission to build a small church in his hometown, Lyry, which is, I think, goes oh, some 30, 40 miles above Paris. And it would be known as Our Lady of Leary. Well, the permission was given and uh, the work begun. And around, I think, oh, 1356 or 7, sometime along in there, just before the church was completed, they were required to take an inventory of the relics. That was a common procedure in those days. You had to tell what relics were, uh, were, were in the possession of the church. And uh, there was a list. And, uh, but, the, but the shroud was not mentioned. So we don't know anything about where it came from in the first place. In other words, it just sort of appeared. The church was opened finally in 1357, no shroud. Then out of nowhere during that year, the latter part of 30, 19, 1357, the shroud appeared and it was being shown by the, uh, the canons of the church. Canons means uh, something like, oh, I think administrators, let's put it that way. They were the ones that were showing this, this shroud. It was, the shroud was thought to be 14 feet wide, long and only four foot uh, in width to cover the body of Jesus, as I've showed you how it was done over here. The bishop at the time was a gentleman by the name of Henri Darquy. And he had heard about this thing being shown. He was very upset about it because he thought there was something very, very wrong about it. And he objected to it in the first place on scriptural grounds, <clears throat> which 
Well, in our, you know, from our point of view, it seems almost funny because you say, well, who cares what the gospel says, how Jesus was buried? But it, you couldn't doubt it in those days. And there's only one of the gospel writers who really tells us about the burial procedure of Jesus, and that was uh, the gospel of St. John. <clears throat> and John tells us that uh, he was uh, wrapped, uh, he was 100 pounds of aloes and s s uh, myrrh and all of this stuff was packed around him. And then a it says it was a cloth put across his face. Well, that's not what we have here, as you see, we were talking about a single piece of cloth. So with this, 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 this single cloth thing is incidentally part of the jury, uh, Jewish uh, burial practices at the time. So right away, the bishop knows something is screwy here. So he puts out inquiries and he finds the fellow who contrived the thing. In other words, it was a painting or a, it was a contrivance of somehow this linen thing with this figure on it. Very cleverly done, the bishop tells us. And also that uh, there were people who were hired to pretend to be sick. There were lingerers who were suddenly cured by just looking at the, at the cloth. And so essentially what it amounted to, it was a money machine. And uh, he, he said, you, get, you just get rid of it and get out of here. At that point, the thing disappeared, just simply disappeared. And uh, that might have been the end of it, but about some, 30 years later, it reappears. This time, there's a, a second bishop who is now responsible for trying to do something about this outrage. His name was Pierre Darquy, and it must be that he must have been a son or, or a nephew, I don't know, a nephew or whatever. He was obviously related to the previous bishop. <clears throat> and he writes a letter still extant, incidentally, to the Pope. Now, interestingly enough, in those days there were two Popes, one in Rome and one in Avignon in, in France. This was days of the so-called Babylonian captivity. The main Pope really was the one in Avignon, to tell you the truth, that he would have the power and, and all the rest of it. Pierre d'Arquy, the, the second bishop, he refers to the earlier bishop telling about the outrage of this showing of this, uh, this thing. And he said that uh, he, he was having the same experience. It was, they were just uh, uh, malingerers and that kind of thing. And he wanted it stopped. The Pope at the time was Clement VII. And Clement VII read this thing and he was put on the horns of a dilemma really because he was in part related to the, to the Charny family, the people that owned, technically owned that cloth. And so what could he do? He said, well, he said, you, you can show it. You can show the cloth. But under no circumstances are you to say it's anything like a relic. It's a representation. That's all it is. You're not to have bugle calls and you're not to have torches and all the parades or any of that kind of thing. You can show it and that's all you can do. <clears throat> well, of course, that was like bidding water to run uphill for God's sakes. I mean, of course, <laughs> They're going, to blow, they're going to blast bugles, they're going to have fires and everything else. They're going to raise money. I pause here to say, you, you wonder what the circumstances were in France that this thing was such a, such a sensation. And I would reply, you know, that, that France in the, in the 1300s was a very sad, very sad place indeed. They had crop failures all over West, Western Europe, but especially in France. The population was starving to death. And if that weren't bad enough, the uh, coming across from Venice was the, uh, the, the, the plague came across Europe, wiping out almost a third of the population. Well, that would have solved the problem of the food, except that there was so few people to work the land, so the starvation went on. France was involved in a hundred years war with England and all that that would entail. The countryside was, <laughs> given over to bandits, basically. The country wasn't safe. And here's another thing. Religion was uncertain in, the, in France because there were two popes. If you pledged your allegiance to one pope, the other pope would, uh, would excommunicate you. Well, the consequence of that was that all of Christendom in, in Western Europe was effectively excommunicated if they took any allegiance to any one of the popes. And I think, too, another thing, all the churches that were being built at this time, they're all having to do with Mary. Mary, the mother of God, Mother Mary, the queen of heaven and all this, because she is so approachable that, you know, Jesus is such a distant figure, such an 
awesome figure, you know, you can't, but you can approach his mother. So D Jesus had kind of, was kind of in the background when all of a sudden you have this, this, this burial cloth. Well, that really, I mean, I, that really pl plugged it all back in, so to speak. Well, the widow, uh, the widow uh, of, uh, of, uh, of Sharni, the, the knight, she and her relatives she, they went about all over, over Europe, mostly in the area around France, not too far east, but raising money, just every, it's like a county fair, and they just made all kinds of money. And uh, even a century later, in 1449, the cloth was being shown, and I want to read you something. This was in 1440 in, a, in the town of Liège. I, that's uh, uh, that's in the modern part of Belgium. And a uh, writing at the time was a Cornelius Zantiflet, and here's here's what he says of the of the cloth. He says, "A certain sheet on which the shape of our Lord Jesus Christ has been skillfully painted, with remarkable artistry, shows the outlines of all the limbs and with the feet, hands and sides stained with blood red." as if they had recently suffered stigmata and wounds. They knew it was phony then. They knew it. How could we still be wondering what? This is crazy. The Pope is in front of this thing. It's crazy. Well, the, uh, the family of the, of, uh, the, the Sharni family got tired of this, I guess, going around. <laughs> with a tent show, so to speak. So they made negotiations with the Duke of Savoy, and they, in, eight, in 1453, they exchanged the, uh, the shroud for some, some land, for some, some land. And now the thing was in the family of the, the Savoy Dukes. And uh, they didn't show it. They didn't use it for money. They, <clears throat> apparently what they did was just t to take it around them on travels as a kind of a good luck, a good luck piece or something like that. It was stored in southern France, and in 1532 there was a fire that almost destroyed the thing, and it suffered very grievously. And I'm going to show you some spots on the on the shroud, to, so that because we were talking about it in a later posting. But do you see these kind of lozenges here? What happened was the silver. Of the, re 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 of the box melted and fell through onto the, co the cloth. The cloth was evidently wound, it was wrapped over twice, once on itself and then one more time. And so it burned, it burned these, uh, these holes, what appear to be holes. Actually what they are, they're, they're fresh pieces of cloth that nuns stitched into the, uh, into the uh, to repair the, uh, to pr repair the cloth. They took pieces of, of linen and just sewed them in there so that the cloth would be whole once again. And uh, we'll address that matter later on. Finally, in, fi in the year of 1578, the cloth was removed to the church uh, of San Juan Batista. It's a, uh, I think it's a basilica in, uh, well, no matter anyway, it, it's, in, it's in Torino. We call it, we keep calling it the Shroud of Turner. It should be the Shroud of Torino, really, but we, we, everyone calls it the Shroud of Turin. And there it stayed. And so the thing was more or less forgotten, forgotten, forgotten. It was shown from time to time, and occasionally for weddings and things like that, they'd schlep the thing out and put it over the altar. In 1898, an event happened that exploded the whole thing once again. And here's what happened. They showed the shroud over the main altar. There's no glass in front of it. They just stretched it out in front of the... Everybody could get a view of it. And there was an amateur photographer by the name of Secondo Pio who wanted to take pictures of the, of the shroud. He was given permission to do so. Now, in 1898, you know, photography was not what it is today. They used glass plates. Uh, they uh, were pretty primitive procedure. The lenses, of course, were perfectly okay. But it was a pretty primitive situation, and not only that, you can imagine in a church there just isn't there isn't any light outside of candlelight and what what comes through with a stained glass. But there isn't much light in there. And when he took a pictures when he took pictures of the shroud, it, he had to expose his glass plates. They didn't have 
or he didn't have anyway, a roll of film or anything like that. He had glass plates, 30 minute exposures. That gives you some idea of trying to capture what light they could. And here's a mysterious thing, and this is what really started the whole modern matter of, of the shroud, the mysteries of the shroud. Now, when you take a, and I'm going to do, for those of you that are old enough to remember film, when we first had the, the film we developed, it was called a negative. And then from the negative, you printed a positive. Of course, you young folks, of course, you're doing with your, uh, digital photography, you probably don't know what I'm talking about, so I'm going to be careful and try to inform you in this matter. Uh, in those days when you took your picture for processing, the first thing that they developed was the so-called negative. Now here's a picture, now you have to imagine, I'll hold it right, now here's a young man with a tattoo. There we go. Now. Okay, now just imagine he is standing right here next to me, and we take a picture of him, and we, and we ask, we take it to the lab, the, the, the negative, the, the, the film, we say, please just, uh, just develop the negative. This is what we expect to see. So you barely make it out. Everything is reversed, you see. Everything is reversed. The 1898 photo that uh, the the negative that uh, uh, Secondo Pio, when he had it developed, instead of it coming out as a, a negative like that, it turned out as a positive like this, and he couldn't, simply couldn't understand it. And so to show you what really he saw on his negative, this is the best, best I can do for you. A positive in, I, image of a face. A miracle. Never bothered to find out how it, such a thing could happen. It's a miracle. Always the answer. It's a miracle. Don't wait for explanations. If an explanation isn't instantly available, it's a miracle. Well, now I'm going to leave it at this point. This will be, shall we say, shroud number one. And I'll want you to join me directly for shroud number two, and we will explore additional reasons beside the historical one, which was to the effect this thing was a total fraud. Now we will show the scientific examinations of it to show that it was an utter, utter fraud.